In the wake of competitive card games with their top decking and mana screwing, there is one game that has arisen from the ashes. Consistency. Dice rolling. Will this be the new cardboard crack? Find out in this shelf side review. How about a card game where you don't really get bad draws and you're actually managing a lot of dice? 10 of them. Actually, you start the game managing 10 dice. Perhaps Ashes Reborn is the right opportunity for us mana screwed, unlucky MTG players to rise from the ashes and find a new lifestyle game. Or perhaps Ashes Reborn is not really for you and you should go back to playing Magic instead. Let's find out if this is for you. Let's go. So here's a quick how to play. Ashes Reborn is all about planeswalkers fighting Phoenixborn, sorry, they're called Phoenixborn in this game, fighting against each other. Who is you? So you're playing a Phoenixborn, fighting against someone else's Phoenixborn, and you're trying to bring each other's health to zero. First guy that dies loses the game. To do that, you're playing monsters to the board, using your special Phoenixborn abilities, and using all sorts of spells. The catch with Ashes is that there's no land cards like in Magic the Gathering that you're tapping, but instead you have these 10 dice that are used to pay for abilities. So games of Ashes will look like this. You'll have your Phoenix board with its deck, pick any five cards from your deck as your starting hand, and then you'll roll your deck's 10 dice. Then on your turn, you have one main action you can do and one side action. When you use an ability on the board or attack, your cards will exhaust, which is kind of like tapping in MTG, but you know, for like legality reasons and whatnot, this is a token instead. So once you've paid for and performed your two actions, your opponent goes and does the same thing. Both players keep doing these smaller turns until they both pass, likely because they're both out of dice to use. Then, new round time. Your guys are no longer tired, remove those exhaustion tokens, the first player token changes, you roll the dice to use again, and then draw back up to 5 cards. Just keep going in this cycle of playing cards, spending dice, attacking, then starting new rounds until one planeswalker dies. What? Planeswalker? Did I say that? Sorry, Phoenixborn. They're called Phoenixborn in this game. You keep going until one of the Phoenixborn dies. That's how you play the game. So now let's get to the pros of Ashes. What's so awesome about this game system that might make it your next cardboard crack? For us, we haven't gone too down that road of cardboard crack, so we're only talking from this perspective of a master set. So first off, we were impressed by the cards, and this is super important because this is a card game. We're glad to say that each of the cards feels great in the hand. They sound like this. Should be good enough. And yeah, I know enthusiasts will be yelling at me to sleeve these cards, so here you go. Same size as Magic the Gathering. Other things you get are all these tokens, which are standard fare for these types of core sets, and then being double-sided is actually very useful. The super colorful dice, which you'll be constantly touching and re-rolling between rounds, are great feeling. And I think they got the size just right to re-roll. The art looks great, with this high fantasy style that makes each Phoenixborn and monster stand out. If it looks familiar, that's because it's the exact same artist from the board game Dead of Winter. The game also includes streamlined player aids that really help you understand the novel flow of this game. Then even better, there's these nice dice references that tell you, hey, no, 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 this is where your dice go. So then you and your opponent can keep all of the 10 dice really organized. No dice mayhem going over the map here. The rulebook also feels like the perfect size for a card game. You can very easily just bring it with you to read on the toilet if you want to. We wish there was a fact, but for the most part, the rulebook is good and explains concepts well with a glossary. Now, my fellow card game homies, this part we're going into is going to sound really familiar as we explain the diversity of all these cards. There is so much to wrap your head around that for card game veterans will be like, duh. Duh, there's units that have different stats. Duh, there's reaction spells. Duh, there are cards that let you draw more cards. Ashes gives you this diversity that, well, is just like Magic the Gathering. So we suspect while reading these cards, you will feel right at home. Units have special abilities when spawned, or you can use an action to activate abilities. 
then cards all have different costs that you pay with certain dice, and even the game lets you manipulate your dice with cards. But how about this card for gameplay, which will really start to tease how Ashes wants consistent feeling games. There's something called Conjurations, which are units you can spawn from a side deck. To get these Conjurations, you drop these ready spells, but the trick here is that the ready spells stay on the board. That means that in this game, you always have access to Conjurations as the game progresses, meaning that you can't really complain about not drawing units at all. Just keep exhausting these spawn portals turn after turn to spawn more dudes. So now let's get into what makes this gameplay so special, and not just a generic MTG dueling mage clone. Even though units do have two stats, an attacking and a health one, and then you do attack your enemy by exhausting them, then you can assign blockers. So that all seems familiar. But then from there, the game really starts diverging into its own special game. We want to praise how Ashes really distinguishes itself and rewards long-term planning with its round-on-round -round structure, where most games just have turns. So in most card games, you just simply pass turns until someone wins. Ashes has you pass turns within the structure of rounds, of which afterwards lets you finally refresh your mana. Then you can finally draw cards because you don't draw for every turn. Ashes really stands apart as a game where you constantly have to be thinking about how your mana will carry over for future turns, where you're not just trying to spend your mana turn after turn. Factor in that with the round, there's an actual first turn dynamic that matters. So you're watching that first player marker to see who's going first next round because they might get a cool surprise attack. There's two colors to manage with three symbols on each, and the game actually gives you plenty of ways to increase the faces. Make sure you don't go overboard in spending your dice, because if you're all out of them and your opponent has tons of mana, you're in a lot of trouble. So you're already rethinking on how to manage these resources with the round on round structure. What's next for the heavy planning demands is that every single turn is only two actions. Two actions. That's it. You got one man action and one side action. So it doesn't matter how late the game is, how advanced your board state is, you only got two things to do. The two action system puts Ashes in a tight gameplay loop where you and your opponent are constantly giving out one two punches. This makes the game feel like this fast paced, engrossing game of micro actions as you and your opponent constantly respond to each other. Plus this restriction means that you really have to think about spending your turns. Like even attacking is an action, so you can't just attack because you feel like it. There's no shortage of ways to mix and match your main and side action. Like you could do some quick setup, like playing a card and then meditating, or you could go bigger by dropping a unit and then using their ability right away. So now this already feels like a more serious game with this emphasis on planning. And to really dial you in to that serious planning mindset is the luck mitigation. There's so much of it in this game that it feels like the designer was kind of like this. Oh man, okay, I've gone so far. I just need to draw half decent. This guy doesn't know what he's doing. It should be in the bag. Let me just see what I got here. Wait, what? No, no, no Lance? Okay, I need a mulligan. For a mana system with two types of colors, it's really cool how you don't have to worry about top decking the wrong type of mana or not top decking any mana at all. Actually, you saw our poor magic player mulliganing for a new hand. You will never do that in this game too, because you choose your starting hand. You just straight up pick five cards you want to start with, and you get it. This will straight up shock deck builders, of where you can just get what you want. This is something we've never seen in a lifestyle card game before, and will literally guarantee you will get whatever five cards you want to start with. This gives you decision making before the game even starts, as you can choose based off the color of dice your opponent is playing, or even their Phoenix born ability. So you might be saying, awesome, they fixed the bad hands, but oh, these were the dice. Doesn't that mean there's gonna be a lot of unlucky rolls coming up? Well, actually in this game, it doesn't really happen because there's 10 dice, five of each color, and when you roll them, the 10 dice actually almost always gives you fair rolls. And the mana system is fairly flexible. You can use 
higher, better roles to pay for lesser quality things. And then there's also basic requirements that can be paid for by both colors. If that's not enough luck mitigation, there's a key side action, notice how it's a side action, called meditate. This lets you take any die and just move it up to the max value. You can even discard from the top of the deck to do this, so there's not really any excuse not to do it. Or how about both players drawing up to five cards at the start of every round? So you are definitely going to be drawing a lot of cards to keep your options really big. Or just discard cards you don't want. Say goodbye to those dead cards that just clog up your hand. This is where the luck mitigation just works so beautifully with the game's emphasis on planning. There's that feeling of out-tempoing your opponent to use all your dice perfectly to get a leg up on the next round. Or what about destroying one of his expensive units for less dice than he paid for it? And then he just has to pass because he has no dice to spend and no units to attack with. For you, my man, it was a good idea that you saved your dice and now you have free reign to do actions when he can't. Actually, before we get to the decks, let's talk about the Phoenix Board abilities. They all have their own special ability. So we got Aradiel, Adriel, Arad, Aradil. Anyways, she can just water blast someone for two damage. Or you got Cole, who can discard cards from his hand to damage the opponent. Okay, so as for the six pre-builds, each of them feels a lot different. Cole is the most straightforward, who wants to play allies from his hand, like this coal miner that lets him draw two cards if it survives. Then use the drawn cards to activate Cole's ability to hurt your opponent's units. My favorite is Mione Viper, who has a focus on ramping up for the late game. She wants to summon these Gilders, which are super cute mice, and then actually have them die to feed her big snake. This snake gets bigger every time one of your opponent's units dies too, so its attack value will just keep going up. Plus, you can activate Mione's Phoenix Born ability to do damage to another unit equal to the tokens on this snake. We want to come back to the dice, which give even more asymmetry because they can actually trigger abilities of their own. Dice with abilities in a card game. You can always use the highest roll possible as its own side action, making each color feel alive. The natural guys can just get froggy with it, spend that frog to blast one damage on their enemy. And then you got the ceremonial using their dark zombie thing to spend the highest roll to grab something from the discard. So we found that when you toss in all of these interesting ways to mitigate luck, and then the round structure with the dice, the Ashes stands really well as a new type of card game that prioritizes fair and crunchy matches really well. What is so important about Ashes with the dice and the tit for tat round structure is that it's still a card game. So with that, there's no solved way to use your dice, making you really rack your brain on how to use your board and your hand. We also want to point out that we haven't seen any quick wins and this goes going back again to the whole fair feeling nature of the game, where it seems unlikely that you can just cheese a win. To wrap it up, there's a pretty good value in this box. There aren't any other playable cards besides what you get in the decks, but you get six decks and 40 beautiful dice. After a couple games under your belt, you probably want to mix the cards and just make your own decks, or you can just draft cards. So now we're on to the cons of this corset. Remember, we haven't played with any of the expansion cards, so we're just talking about what we have here. And the criticism is these decks are not very well thought out. Their asymmetry is really cool, but their balance is all over the place, and the game doesn't tell you which ones to start with. So it's entirely possible that first games of Ashes could go really sour if you pick the wrong matchup of these decks. For example, Noah, the assassin, he just, he just blows. He's not good. His power level just feels way weaker than everyone else, as he can't really swarm the board quickly to get his combos off before just dying. And these are less weak, but the crazy blood lady, Jessa Nani, and the sorcerer, Saria Guideman have some small issues. The crazy looking tribal weirdo wants to attack her opponent by hurting her own units but newcomers are really going to struggle in how to use these soggy blood puppets. 
Surya wants to mill out her opponent's deck to zero. Like how about giving them a disgustingly luxurious meal? But her methods overall feel pretty slow, so you might just want to attack normally. The strength level inequality is made even worse by the fact that you get 3 of every card, even the very situational ones. Like Jessa has this spell that hurts her units to get rid of an alteration spell, which sounds pretty cool. Well you probably don't want to target your own, but what if your opponent just doesn't have alterations? Then you have 3 useless cards in your deck. Since each of the decks do play so uniquely, there can be a lot of triplet copies of dead cards. Like how about this card that gets triggered when your opponent attacks? But then Jessanani doesn't actually attack you, she just bleeds you out without attacking. So this is where Ashes kinda shot itself in the foot with these pre-con decks, because they want them to be cool, but also simple and basic enough for a newcomer to just grab them and start playing. But because of that, they can be very repetitive and watered down to fall flat in all that cool they're trying to do especially if you're a newcomer trying to pilot them. So here's our advice on what to start with. For your first game, start with Cole, who is the most straightforward. Then use Aerodol, Aradol, I don't know her name, and then Moni. Mix and match with these three for a while, and then delve into the others with lowered expectations on winning. That's it for the cons, now it's time for the nitpicks. The first one is that this game's length, not in terms of rounds, but in terms of time, can get on the longer side for some people. Like sure, you only get two actions, a side action and a main action, but you can do them in any order. And then you got your hand to manage, you got the dice, you got your units, you got your ready spells, you also got all your opponent stuff that's not on frame right now. It's a lot. There will most likely be a bunch of ready spells by the time late game rolls around. So even though you don't have more dice to spend, you have more ready spells to use, you got your units on the board with abilities, plus the 5 cards you always have to start each round. Think, think, think away on how to spend your dice, but really, if the game is taking a long time, it likely means that it's a close match, as you're rarely praying for top decks, and you'll be engaged the entire time. Next, there's some aspects of the art. Yeah I know we said how good it was, but the fact is that for ready spells, these guys, it can get kind of confusing because it's just a book for all the cards with some writing on it. These do tend to blend together in your hand and on the board, so really if they could have the monster they summon coming out of them, that would help a lot. Now let's give you guys the recommendations. Now this isn't going to be a score because that feels weird to give to just an intro box and also there's so much about the deck building we just don't know about yet. Like our only glaring con is not about this system, but it's about these pre-con decks, which won't matter at all if you get really deep into Ashes. Like hey, shout out to Plate Hat stating themselves that Noah is hot garbage. Props to you guys for that honesty, really appreciate that. For coming to Ashes for the first time with Ashes Reborn, we're impressed. While it looks like a familiar mage duel card game, of which historically rely on some type of top decking, Ashes doesn't really have that and constantly feels fair as a result. But Ashes system is actually so different from other competitive card games that it's not just a no brainer, duh, luck mitigated version of magic you should buy. Ashes is a card game where the overhead of managing cards and dice is so clear off the bat. Pick any 5 cards you want, get 10 dice. Plan for rounds, not just turns. The back and forth gameplay ensures that one guy isn't ever going to keep comboing, so make sure you stay true to the fundamentals of spending your dice well. To really reduce that comeback potential, the game doesn't have a big payoff in hand advantage. And this gets into… look. We had a lot of talk about consistency and interesting board states with the asymmetry, but did we ever talk about anything big happening in this game? Not really. Compared to card games we've played, there hasn't been any big combos and ashes that the decks are leading up to, especially with that turn restriction. There is nothing we saw in this box that just utterly dropped our jaw and said, oh my goodness, 
that is crazy crazy when that happens to go off. To understand this a little more, let's go down memory lane. Let me get my old cards out. So with these, let's go down our trip of competitive card game memory lane. In our favorite Yu-Gi-Oh, you can have turns where you combo like crazy. Summoning all these flashy monsters from your side deck, drawing cards, getting stuff from the discard, and then launching a huge attack. In the more popular Magic the Gathering, you're guaranteed more late game craziness with all the land stacking up, and cards reward that. You can spend a ridiculous amount of resources for a huge monster that dominates the board, or just play really strong spells. When we get to Android Netrunner, this one is a little similar to Ashes in terms of limiting your actions per turn. One side will only have three actions. But it's filled with mind games and comeback potential. Like if you look here, you can have a super big payoff from attacking your opponent's deck, and then you grab a three point card, which is a lot in that game. Returning to Ashes, we again don't have those big swings, but you will certainly still see crucial turns. Something typical is debating to use your turn to push for a final attack and hoping your opponent doesn't drop a reaction spell with their leftover dice. Again, these reservations about Ashes could be starter set woes. In this box, we found that board states get increasingly complex, but the engine and turn flow of everything stay the same. No economic engine to build up to, and also it won't be there to easily rely upon late game. To give you a good grasp on what Ashes means to a card game player, let's bring up these stereotyped personalities. We got Timmy, who just likes to win really big, doesn't matter how many times he wins. Then we got Johnny, who just wants to win in a unique way. And then there's Spike. He just wants to win. He wants to win consistently. There's an insane amount of room for unique wanting Johnny and win loving Spike in Ashes. But for poor little Timmy here, not so much. Remember, it doesn't matter how well you top deck later in Ashes, if you don't have your tempo set up right, that casual Timmy is still gonna lose the game. Ugh, okay, yeah, well, most people are not just one of these groups of people and are a mix of two or three. So just determine how much Timmy you have in you before deciding to pick up Ashes Reborn. Ah, there is a three and four player mode in this box, which we haven't tried, but it is really cool how they give you all these components to just play a multiplayer free for all. At a glance, we are concerned on how that gameplay would even end in a reasonable amount of time and be balanced. And if you're into Ashes, you probably don't care much about the multiplayer anyways. As I said, we're not giving out a critical score for this game, but we are gonna give out a personal score. So I'm gonna give this a eight out of 10. I have a great time with it. I have been on the prowl for the next lifestyle card game. Not because I have the time to really sink in with them and compete with them, but because I'm curious on what is the next sort of game that will distract me from making more board game videos. My first game though was actually pretty disappointing. I felt like the game was so slow, so restrictive, and I found it weird that you don't draw every single turn. A card game with this tempo just felt weird, but I gave the game hope because I thought the mechanics were decently sound, and upon investigation, I realized that I played against Noah, this garbage pre-built deck not good. It's not good. He just sucks. So I gave the game another go with different decks, and it all started just warming up as I turned off my MTG expectations of game flow. The turns got snappier and snappier as I memorized cards, and I started really enjoying myself in the game's system. I'm gonna say it. I'm getting sucked in. It's happening. I don't know how deep I'm gonna go. I don't know how many hours I can spend on the game, but I'm already thinking about buying those expansions. Please subscribe to Shelf Side to help me to support, support my, my, my card game addiction. Remember these three stereotyped dudes? I'm actually a pretty healthy mix of all three. So my inner Timmy is not getting that chance to play around with the silliness and ashes because there's not that much silly. But the Johnny and Spike in me is having a great time. So I'll probably be sticking around with ashes for at least a couple months, maybe years. And 
I guess time to buy expansions? I'll deck build first. No need to uh, spend money that fast, you know? Thank you for watching the video, guys. As always, thanks to our patrons. We got John S, Manuel G, Brian C, Clifford H, Aaron W, Max B, Bora, Jeremy M, C, Charlie P, Quinton S, Sam S, Sam, Sam S, Travis R, Alvin Y, Momsy K, Ryan D, Jennifer L, Brett, Brett M, Matt G, Peter Z, Spinner 71, Ryan J, Brad G, Tiamo, period, Mark A, Nick James B, Evan, Evan B, Charles P Jr., Josh J, Baspar, Rado, Sophie, Rainer Z, and Colin, Colin Allen. And we got two Mad Lads of Cardboard, three Mad Lads of Cardboard, we got ZL, Jeff L, and this guy who wants his name on screen. And then we got Amy, our Mad Lady of Cardboard. Thank you guys so much. If you wanna check out our Patreon, help the channel out, check out the link in the description below. We got so many big projects coming out for you guys. So remember to sub and like if you enjoy this type of content. And as always, let me know what you like about Ashes if you've played it and recommend any board games for us to try. Daniel's coming back. All those videos coming out for you guys. See you guys soon. Bye-bye.